Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eva, and I am the financial manager at the college. I would like to thank all of you joining us for this breakout session. I commitment to competence and ethical practice, the revised CCP. This session will be led by the college's professional practice staff. Christina Wen Seko and Jennifer Burt Yanoff. It is my pleasure to introduce my two colleagues, Christina and Jennifer. Christina was delighted to become the Director of Professional Practice at the Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers in October 2016. In this role, Christina aids in developing resources to support members in their competence and ethical practice, reaches out to stakeholders to promote how college membership contributes to a college of excellency in the workplace and supports the college's mandates of protecting the public. Prior to working at the college, Christina was on the provincial board of directors at OASW, a member of the MSW Gerontology Stream Clickering Review Committee at the University of Toronto, a member of the committee advisory committee at Lyerson University an online course instructor, and had a private practice. Jennifer joined the Ontario College of Social Workers and Social Service Workers at the Professional Practice Associates in the summer of 2015. In this position, Jennifer responds to practice inquiries from members, employers, and the public. She provides presentations on behalf of the college to members, educators, social work, and social service work students on a range of issues impacting practice. Jennifer contributes the interpretation of the college's stand, uh, codes of ethics and the standards of practice, and the articulation of their relationship to ongoing practice. She also contributes to policy development and provides support to members concerning the competent uh, program. Ch Jennifer and Christina. Hello, and thank you for all coming. So thank you, Eva. And Christina and I are two thirds of the professional practice department. Aliyah Yusuf, who's at the back, she can wave her hand, she may be speaking later, um, is the third part of our team. So we're two of three, and Aliyah rounds out our team at the back. So I wanna thank you for attending our session. Here's a brief agenda for the next 45 minutes of what we're gonna talk about with regards to the Continuing Competence Program, or as you know, the CCP. 
And keep in mind that the slides are available on the website and will be available for you to review afterwards and download at your leisure. So our agenda is going to encompass a review of the new CCP, what those steps are and what they entail, what the new documents are, and we give you some samples. We're gonna go through some scenarios that may resonate with some of you. Um, in particular, some lived experiences that we've had and have we've received from members. And then we'll be happy to take any questions. But we will also entertain questions throughout the presentation, um, just being mindful of time, but we're happy to address questions as we go through. So this is the new CCP. And for members, you know that this is not new. But what we've done as a result of the evaluation that was completed um, and reviewed, what we did is we streamlined the process, we streamlined the documents, made it feel less onerous so that members could make it meaningful to their practice. So what is required when you complete your CCP before you renew your membership at the end of the year? Well, we need to review our standards of practice. That's the document which speaks to the minimum requirements for our social workers and social service work members. And we ask you to complete any other required documents throughout the year. So for this calendar year, it's the medical assistance in dying article that was sent to members around last August um, that you'll need to review for this year. And we would share what would be those other documents on a year to year basis. We ask you to complete a self assessment um, based on the principles and we will go through that. We also ask you to set goals what you're going to carry out based on the learning activities that you will establish. And then we ask you to make an annual declaration of your participation, which is required when you renew your registration every year. So I ask you, you know, what is the purpose? Like that's the, you know, there's 60 of you here. You know, what would you say you understand is the purpose of the CCP? Why do it? Why make it meaningful? What would some of you say? Bindya. Do you need, can you hear at the back okay? Just ask me a microphone. Sure. Hi, I was saying um, I think that it helps us to stay accountable to ourselves, right? We're setting goals uh, for what we hope to accomplish. And it helps us to sort of check in to make sure that we're following along. It's sort of our mini strategic plan. I sort of see it that way. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have thoughts about what its purpose is? Yeah? Um, I think a part of it is that it, it helps us to remain current with what's going on. The field is constantly changing. And so by having to do some sort of competence, we're keeping up with with new things that are coming because the field is constantly in flux, right? We all know that. So. Mm -hmm. And medical assistance in dying is one of those examples. When there's new changes to legislation, it will impact the practice of many of our members. Anybody else have thoughts or not sure? Just to learn. To learn. To learn. Yeah. Never. Yeah. To be focused on the ethical principles of social work, we should not be tolerating, and whatever we do, we should reflect the principles. Mm -hmm. And we will give you an example of that. Can you repeat that, Jonathan? Do you want to, re you want to stand up? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat it, please? Wait. Wait. We, we need it to be heard on the webcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you just put your hand up, that will all come to you. It's about uh, to be focused on the ethical principles of social work and the guidelines, because sometimes we forget when we are practicing, we have to reflect what we have been doing and make sure that we are following the principles. Mm -hmm. And how about someone who's been in the same position for 30 years, same workplace, same position? How would this be purposeful for them? Or you think of the opposite end of the spectrum, I'm my brand new graduate. I just got my diploma in social service work or I just got my degree in social work. How is this going to be meaningful or purposeful for me?
So entering a new position right out of school, you aren't familiar with the policies and procedures, the applicable legislation, the ethical implications of working in child welfare and how it may resonate with me. Great. So just answering your first question, um, when you said if somebody's been in the field for a really long time, why would this benefit them? I think it can really um, just help uh, in the sense that somebody doesn't have to maybe feel stuck. Um, and it also allows them to use critical thinking um, as, as far as like what new things they can do. I think if we just take the time and sit down and think what we can do, um, that's different, um, it, it can go a long way, really. Perfect. The other thing is that education and development influence and enrich my profession. And it resonates with the four key words that we talked about, that it will show to the public, to your employer, that you're a remaining qualified, competent professional, and ultimately are accountable for the work that you do. That's a great answer. So, what we've said, and you've summarized a lot of this already in all great answers, is that it's our way that we promote quality assurance to our stakeholders. It's a way that we uphold the mandate of public protection. I can say that 99% of our members complete their CCP every year. We can demonstrate that our members are 99% are, are of the time maintaining their competence, whether it's, you know, they've been in the profession for 30 years, they're a new graduate, they're feeling stagnant in a position and they want to challenge themselves, think critically. 99% of our members are doing it on a yearly basis. So, I mean, we encourage, the way to encourage our members to ongoing, as you said, ongo as a way to um, challenge themselves, um, learn new things, and incorporate it into their practice. So I'm gonna show you what the new four revised steps are. Again, not so much different than it was before, but we've streamlined it for you um, so that it's easier to complete. And we wanna talk about how we can make it meaningful to your practice. So the first step is to review, as I said, the Code of Ethics and Standards of Practice and what other documents uh, we've shared with you for the year. So for this year's renewal, as I said, it will be the Medical Assistance and Dying article. The second step will be to complete the self-assessment tool, and I'm gonna show you the sample of that. The third step would be to complete professional development plan. We used to say the SMART goals. We don't say that anymore. We have the professional development plan, which will be pulled from the self-assessment tool or some of the suggestions that you might get from peer feedback. And then the last thing is to retain evidence of those learning activities that you worked on throughout the year and add it to your portfolio for the year. So just a couple of, of new parts to share. So um, what's new this year is to review any other documents. So I mentioned that was the made article. Before you would have reviewed documents that you felt were meaningful to yourself. You gave the example of child welfare in the back. There's lots to read, lots of orientation, new legislation to read as a new graduate. And we're gonna add articles or documents throughout the year that we're going to um, ask you to review as part of your renewal. And another part is to complete a self-assessment. So, you know, you may ask a colleague, a supervisor, um, anyone who's in your circle of where you work. You could ask a friend, a client, just to give you some feedback. What are some areas of strength that you've identified in the work that I do? What are some areas for growth or opportunity that you've noticed in the work that we do together? So we, we give an example where in many workplaces an assessment is done called a 360 assessment where many, many parts of the circle around you provide you with feedback on the role and the work of a social worker or a social service worker that you perform. But oftentimes when we self-assess ourselves, we overcompensate. So we're too positive or we're too negative. And we don't know what we don't know and we're often blind to our own blind spots. So by asking and engaging in the self-assessment, it may give you a more fulsome assessment of where you are or a snapshot in where you are at the moment, like someone like you were speaking to, a critical lens. If I've been in a position for 30 years, in the same position for 30 years, I might be immune to those blind spots. This self-assessment might give you a bigger picture, a fuller picture of where you're at. Yeah. The self-assessment, you, you may ask, 
The self-assessment is a requirement, but you may ask a colleague to give you that assessment. Thank you for asking. Someone else had? Um, you mentioned before uh, that there's a document that you need to post a year. Right. How does that document get selected? Uh, good question. So as an example, and Christina can share, last year there was, there was new legislation around medical assistance in dying, and Christina and I for many months received daily phone calls about medical assistance in dying. So we recognized that there was a need to share a summary of the legislation, provide some practical tools and resources that members could in in incorporate into their practice. And just to, exactly right, and just to further to that, the college in the last year has put out several different e-bulletins, you will have noticed. Um, one of them was on MAID, one of them was psychotherapy, one of them was from the Domestic Violence Death and Review Committee, um, and then of course we also have um, our enduring article about your roles and responsibilities under the Child and Family Services Act. Child and Services Family Act is likely going to be, or it's going to be augmented at some point in time this year, so we didn't want to make that required reading uh, because there's likely going to be changes to it. Uh, the DVDRC article was also just published again in our perspectives. And psychotherapy is always in our perspectives as well. Um, and so we figured that the MAID article was the best e-bulletin for its relevance to recommend that our members read this year again. There was a criteria. <laughs> just added to that, why just one article? We didn't want to make it onerous. Yeah. I'm reading a uh, book as part of our CCP, uh, like our keynote speaker. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I decided to read his book as part of my CCP. Um, oh. uh, can I, do I have to put the, retain the book for seven years, or are you happy uh, in my portfolio just putting down the title and the date that I read it? Good question. I'm sure others have the same question. So just include an excerpt. Include the title, the author. That would be your evidence that you've read the book. You want to have a little paragraph summary. Again, it's up to you. It's based on an adult learning model. So what's meaningful for you, what's not onerous for you, would be acceptable. Okay, thank you. So we, we say in the last point that you've just hit it here, that we ask you to retain the documents in your CCP portfolio for seven years. So whether it's keeping a list of the journal articles you read, you're gonna t retain this as your evidence of having attended AMED today, just retain some evidence of having worked on your learning activities so that you can tick off yes when you renew your registration at the end of the year. So further to the point about the fact that you may get peer review now, um, it's not a requirement, but it's an option that's available to people. And so this is something that is new in the new two, <coughs> 2017 PCP, nope, CCP. Um, and we, it's very interesting because we don't require members, as you know, to submit their CCP to us. Um, and sometimes members, they elect to, and they elect to give us some feedback. And so this was very interesting feedback that we received from a member. And I, I wanted to share it with you today because it was someone's experience about when they did solicit peer feedback um, as part of their CCP. And so this member has been a member for a long time. They're approaching the end of their career. Um, they have received many accolades and awards during their tenured career. Um, and it was very interesting because the feedback that they provided to us was that this was actually one of the most meaningful and rewarding experiences that they had experienced in, in their social work career was speaking to their peers about their practice. Um, and so with your permission, I'd just like to share some of this with you as well. Um, that the member asked for comments about the strengths of my practice and any challenges and for peer input and suggestions for professional development. And one colleague, this was their response. I am a family physician who's had the pleasure to work closely with this member over a number of years. On reviewing a document on the scope of social work practice, I was struck how this member embodies what it means to be a social worker. Not only does their practice span a massive range of potential roles, but they perform each of these roles with excellence. They demonstrate that they have been an agent of positive change. Countless times this member has provided insights and perspectives on challenging clinical situations, and they have not shied away from providing incisive feedback to me when indicated. The member's clinical acumen comes through over and over when we discuss family issues as well as individual conundrums. I will insert one antidote that exemplifies some of the above. 
Recently, as I was seeking this member's supervision and mentorship, I shared a case that demonstrated I was allowing myself to be too personally responsible for a family's struggles, something we can likely all identify with. The member recognized this and helped me separate my own challenges in history from those that paralleled my clients. They deftly and courageously confronted some issues with tr transference and counter-transference. They did so with respect and left me with my dignity intact as I learned an important lesson in my clinical work and development. I already look back with gratitude for the change this has made in improving my practice. Wow, right? Really interesting. Um, and again, maybe you won't receive that same peer feedback from someone. I mean, this is some pretty exemplary feedback. But I think it's a really interesting example of, of what peer feedback can elicit for our own practice. And what this member said, it was a very interesting analogy, that when people talk about the college, sometimes they associate the college with discipline. And you know, that is part of our function, we do do that. And this, mention, or this member rather likened this to the stick approach for the, the college. But then they said that the CCP is proactive and that peer feedback is a carrot. And that this carrot was something that was very meaningful to this member. And it was also very humbling because it gave the member the ability to also give information and educate one of their colleagues on the scopes of practice of a social worker. And so this was a family physician who wasn't necessarily aware of that beforehand. And so it was a really great opportunity for them. So I just thought it was really interesting and I wanted to share it here today um, that again, unsolicited feedback from a member who really found this process of getting peer feedback very rewarding and meaningful to them. So we're going to review in a bit more, docu or a bit more detail rather, um, the revised CCP documents. And, um, the instruction guide obviously needed to be revamped because we have new guides and new documents. Um, the self-assessment tool, which we're going to dive into as well, and the professional development plan. So this is what the self-assessment tool looks like now. Um, you'll notice on the one column there that we are going to allow members to kind of tick off what are the relevant standards about their strengths. In case you can't read the headings, that's what they say. Um, so basically, for your self-assessment, you're going to be looking at what your strengths are. Um, you will have the opportunity to engage in peer feedback. You are going to identify what your learning needs and interests are. You're going to identify how those learning needs and interests apply to our standards of practice. There's a little tick box there that you can tick off which standard it's relevant for. And then you're going to identify some of your learning goals. So again, not entirely new or foreign for the work that we have been doing, but just a more streamlined process. This is what our new professional development plan looks like. As Jennifer mentioned, we don't have SMART goals anymore. As a member of the college myself, I can tell you I'm happy about this. <laughs> Um, but this is our new professional development plan. Um, and again, it's been streamlined where we're going to be identifying what our learning goals are, what are the learning activities and experiences that we're going to be participating in in order to meet those learning goals. We're going to determine what is going to be evidence of how I've completed this goal and activity. What is going to, how am I gonna show that I've actually met this learning goal? And how is this learning goal applicable to my practice? So as we know that through the CCP that there's a lot of different common professional development activities that people engage in. We know that there's going to conferences, coming to AMED, you get to have your certificate of completion today and that certainly can go towards your CCP. Participating in lectures and workshops or webinars. If you were doing research or you were publishing any articles, all of this counts. Um, even independent study, you mentioned a book that you might be reading, absolutely applicable looking at journal articles, um, reviewing documents that we send out, um, observations of other settings. If you're interested in building your capacity about another setting or workplace, you can shadow with some of your colleagues and arrange those different kind of opportunities. And volunteering, committee work, professional networking, teaching, these are all items that are kind of those more traditional CCP professional development activities that a lot of our members participate in regularly. And these are the, some of the activities in which people um, deliver through on their CCP goals and activities. One thing that we noticed, so the reason why we have this new 2017 revised documents and streamlined process is that we conducted an evaluation of the CCP a couple of years ago. And we hired an evaluator and we spoke with stakeholders and we spoke with members and we wanted to know, you know, how could we make this process really meaningful and how could we make this process more accessible to our members? 
something that came through during this evaluation um, and issues that we actually in the professional practice team at the college discuss with members on nearly a daily basis um, is that something that college members weren't aware of, but this has always been part of the CCP, but we're trying to highlight it now for people, um, was that people can use their lived experiences at times in order to um, complete the CCP. Now we're gonna give you a couple examples of this. But we know that the CCP is mandatory for all members of the college, regardless of if you're on maternity leave, if you're on sickness leave, if you're doing a leave of absence, if you're caregiving. If you're an active member of our college or an inactive member of our college, you're, um, then the CCP is mandated for you. So we know that life happens. We know that people have a variety of different things that happen to them, be it bereavement, be it illness, be it requiring to caregive for somebody. Um, and that it can make sometimes the CCP just not accessible or not the top of the priority list or what have you. So what we've been really wanting to advocate and to inform members about is that there are instances when your lived experience can inform your CCP. So we're gonna go through a couple examples in a moment. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll let Jennifer go through the example because I think that you will demonstrate what I'm talking about very well. And the lived experience wasn't something that wasn't feasible before, but I think people didn't appreciate how meaningful it could be to their practice. And my example will show how it, it was meaningful to me and it enhanced my practice. So this, this is my lived experience example from last year. So last year my father-in-law was diagnosed with a cancer diagnosis and it required me to draw upon my years of experience as a hospital social worker. I was very comfortable in that role I knew hospital social work in and out. I'd worked in many different areas of the hospital, the inpatient, outpatients, ICU, emergency department, various parts of the hospital. I was very comfortable in those role. But when this, this happened upon me, it was a role reversal for me. Now I wasn't the social worker or the caregiver or the like, health care <coughs> provider. I was the patient. I was receiving the services. I was providing care to him. And I was asked in the family to be put in that role, but was a like a 360 for me because I was, being, I was so used to being the provider of the care. So this was a new learning experience for me. So I want you to think of this example, think of your own personal lives, your friends' lives, your colleagues' lives, and think about how this could be meaningful to you in the work that you do every day with your patients and your clients. So when we think of this example, and we go to the tool, the self-assessment tool that we've re reviewed so far, keeping in mind that example, <laughs> What would some of you say would be some of the strengths that I demonstrated in my example? Yeah? Communication. Communication. So, Perfect. so he said listening, relaying information, the ability to communicate. Did you have some? Yeah, so I'm just going to repeat, familiarity with the hospital system, the goals. I was very familiar with policies. I was familiar with the legislation as a provider of care in a hospital. You can speak their language. <laughs> right, right. That's, that's, uh, I didn't think about that, but you're right. Absolutely. I was comfortable in that medical setting. Awareness of expectations. Awareness of expectations. Mm -hmm. Expectations of being in hospital. Yeah? Mm. So I, I had colleagues in the hospital I was comfortable with, and I knew their role and how they were going to participate when I provided social work services. Yeah? Relevant standards that you already had acknowledged, so you had something to lean on when you were helping them. I would have said that I was competent as a social worker in a hospital. That's principle two, correct. So drawing upon some of those examples, I need to identify those here in my self-assessment tool. So I pulled three, but we'll just use it for the sake of time. And many of you have said, you have knowledge of the healthcare system. Think of the workplaces that you work, you work in, if you've worked there for a good amount of time, you're very comfortable with that environment. You're comfortable with the systems, the system as a whole, policies, the procedures. So that was identified that I had uh, great knowledge in that area. And so some of the feedback that I received from family was, okay, 
you know this all this information here we are in a hospital we're going to draw upon you to be the spokesperson someone said communicate you know i demonstrated compassion i was patient because i knew the system i knew the the roles of all the healthcare players i knew the policies i knew what to expect i had awareness so i could come with that knowledge and be the communicator demonstrate patience and be compassionate all great so what would be some of the learning needs given that that I would need to establish in order to move forward. So what I've said is, although I knew the legislation in the setting that I worked, this was a different kind of uh, diagnosis that I had not perhaps worked with or hadn't faced myself. So what's different about that? Perhaps the setting that he was in was different than the one that I was familiar with. So what's different? What do I need to learn? What are the policies and procedures in that setting that would be applicable to us as the family? And the resources were definitely different. I was used to an, a rural hospital. Here he was in an urban setting, a large urban setting. There's hundreds of patients. So there were certainly was some similarities, but there was a lot of differences. I needed to know the resources to help as the spokesperson for our family. Do you have a question? So I was going to say also, perhaps even the, the need to develop, or the need to adopt a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So I must repeat, it was about um, developing a new perspective. And absolutely, the lens that I walk, every time I walked into the hospital, I walked through the lens of a social worker. When I walked into the hospital to see him, I was walking in as a patient. From the moment I walked in, sanitized my hands, waited for the elevator, walked up to the room, signed in because he was in isolation room, all very different than when I was a staff member and I just had to wear my ID and walk through. So absolutely, my perspective changed. So, you know, it was going to help me be competent. It was going to increase my knowledge to apply it to when I returned to the hospital as a social worker in the knowledge that I brought in providing services to my patients. So that's actually really interesting feedback. Um, part of the evaluation that we did as well came out that there was a lot of misinformation out there, misunderstanding. You didn't actually have to make a goal for every standard. Right. No, I know that. Oh, okay. Just that still, there, there was a section where you would identify strengths. Yes. And areas for improvement if you had any. Yes. But at least and now we're linking them to the standards. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. Yeah. Because it's not just the standards, it's the strengths. Yeah. 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 Yeah
you know, we have our strengths, some feedback that I got from some family, um, what were some of my learning goals, what the relevant standards were, and so what my learning goal was, was to increase my knowledge of being a caregiver to a loved one with a cancer diagnosis. It kind of is reflected in the first four columns to be able to establish the goal. So if my goal is to increase my understanding of being a caregiver to someone with a cancer diagnosis, then we want to think about, we're going to go to the next, what some of the activities could be. So for me, I needed to, re although I had some knowledge of relevant legislation in the place that I worked, there was different legislation that I didn't know that was meaningful now. Now we're in the, I'm wearing the patient hat. So what's the patient's first act, right? What does the Healthcare Consent Act? What does the hospital's act say with regards to patients? When I'm the pa thinking of myself as the patient and caregiver. You know, what are the applicable policies? What are some of the resources in the community that I'm gonna use now as a patient or caregiver? For example, CCAC. Different than when I knew that I was a provider and was relying upon them to provide services to my patients or clients. Could I keep a reflective journal of my experience as a caregiver? being mindful of myself, reflecting and reviewing my experience thus far. And then might I would engage in mindfulness practice, engage in yoga, go for walks, take my father-in-law for a walk when he was feeling well, take him outside for some fresh air. Again, all these are things to enhance my learning. And then the last thing is perhaps to attend a family support group. There's many groups that were available in the hospital that he was in, but maybe in your neighborhood or your community, your church, local community groups, anything that you feel is going, again, going to help you achieve your goal. So I looked at these activities and then I transferred it to the, the last document to complete, the professional development plan. So I'm going to establish those goals. Again, my goal is to enhance my knowledge of being a caregiver or a loved one with a cancer diagnosis. So what are my activities I'm going to work on? What would be evidence of having completed them? And how am I going to apply it to my practice so it's meaningful? So I'm gonna give you one example. So again, I wanna increase my knowledge of being a caregiver. <coughs> what are some of the learning activities that I'm going to participate in? Many of you have said them. You know, engage in mindfulness practice, go for a walk, learn the resources, review applicable legislation. Because it's going to augment my practice when I return to work as a social worker in a hospital. And then what would be evidence of completion? Well, perhaps I'm gonna enroll in one of those groups. I'm gonna review those resources and summarize them for me. I'm going to pick up Peter Menzies' book and review it and reflect upon it and incorporate it into my practice when I'm thinking about change. And then how am I going to apply it to my practice? How am I going to make it meaningful? Well, I'm going to be able to demonstrate empathy. You know, we are empathetic, but now I'm going to effectively be able to demonstrate it in the work that I do with my patients. I just have a question about, I'm just going to stay in this uh, your example. Sure. Sorry, my question is, um, sometimes you fall, people fall, or sorry, members, fall into situations where they go through lived experiences or even other things that fall into professional development, but you end up, you end up learning something that you never kind of set out to learn. Mm -hmm. um, how would you incorporate that into, uh, into your professional development plan? Because maybe, for you personally, maybe you were aware that this is going to be something that I can um, learn through, mm -hmm. um, but maybe for some people they wouldn't have framed their mind that way, and then afterwards they would realize that, hey, mm -hmm. I, I, I got a lot out of this. Sure. Experience. So I think it's a living document. It's not like I, I write this in January, I can't amend it throughout the year. So maybe I felt I was a patient person as a social worker in the hospital and I wanted to draw upon that as a caregiver or a patient, but I'm displaying no sense of patience at all in being in the other seat. So, you know, we're not here to say you're doing it wrong or you haven't met the requirements. Again, it's at your discretion based on your learning, based on what's meaningful for you. So if you don't achieve a goal, carry it over the next year. If you want to add a goal or add a, a learning activity throughout the year, by all means. I guess my question is more you something mm -hmm. without having set a goal in the beginning. Hmm. So I would have this filled out, but there's no goal because I didn't set a goal, but I, I, I acknowledge that I didn't learn something. You know what I mean? You do need to set a goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So go back and set a goal. Yeah. What did you learn? So, for example, how to be reflective and, and aware that I need to accept that I'm a, I'm a patient and I'm not a social worker in this situation. So perhaps I want to learn the difference between being a patient and a caregiver. The difference between a patient and being a professional in a hospital system. Well, what is the difference? You know, again, maybe you learn along the way and you establish goals. I mean, it's what's so meaningful for you. So it's a kind of hindsight goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you know, we don't audit at the moment. You know, we don't randomly pull names and say, hey, show me your CCP. So again, you know, call us if you have questions. If you're stuck throughout the year, Aliyah, myself, and Christina field calls throughout the year regarding the CCP. A good question, thank you. Yeah. Um, you just touched on auditing, and you said <laughs> that we don't audit yet. Is that something that's going to happen? Uh, if, if we're going to audit, you would be given. Sorry, I'm going to repeat it for okay. the mic. You mentioned auditing. Is that something that's going to happen in the future? Because right now you said we don't audit yet. I'll pull back the yet. Okay. <laughs> if there was ever going to be an audit, you'd be given fair warning and notice. We would let you know. But at this point, we're not in the position to be auditing. And we're not randomly asking members for their CCP. But if that's something that changes, the council recommends that the staff do, the professional practice that you participates in, you will know, we will let you know. But 99% of our members complete their CCP every year, so we know that most of our members are doing it. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Yeah, my question, is it yeah. done? Okay, my question is, uh, when it comes to the goal, I'll give you an example. I said my goal was to learn mindfulness, mm -hmm. or to use mindfulness. Okay. And then it says, you know, when to accomplish. For me, it's ongoing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So sure. how do you do that? Like, I'm still learning, mm -hmm. and I want to learn more. Okay. So. Good question. So how do you put it there? That's where my thing was. Okay. Like, Does anybody dates, want to give suggestions? I'm going to read three or four articles on mindfulness. Okay. Okay. Anybody else suggestions? Maybe I'm going to investigate how learning something can disappear. So I was mindful in 2015 about something very similar to what's happening now that I'm just not able to do. It. So maybe doing that research or something. So if we don't, if we don't continue to use it, we lose our understanding of it and our application into our practice. Yeah? I don't have a good example, but it's the, it, it, the notion is that of measuring progression. Mm -hmm. So this is where I am today, where do I expect to be tomorrow, and what is the evidence to indicate that change? So you have some knowledge of mindfulness. What more do you want to know? Do you want to? Yeah, you see, that's, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example, but go ahead. I would go, hello, I would go to a conference or a lecture, read a book, read an article, um, have some peer supervision maybe about it, but I would, I would measure it in a quantitative way and work on it. Mm -hmm. At the back, do you have a comment on how you measure? It's like raising a child. You never fully raise a child. They take years to raise. Um, so, you know, you're still ongoing in that journey, and I think that that goal would be something on, ongoing the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you. 
Hold on. Can we use the microphone? you apply for that so I, because I could see here the application mm -hmm. and then I would I would think that um, the measurement could be impacting you for a certain degree That's does that make sense for you yeah. yes well I'll give you an example and we'll move on um, just for the sake of time um, my children engage in mindfulness practice after lunch in their school the teacher goes the principal goes on the microphone and it's a one minute mindfulness. I just learned about this this week from them. <laughs> but you know, if I ask the teacher, you know, the afternoon is hazy, chaotic, they've had their lunch, maybe they've had sugary snacks, they need to you know, center themselves, reflect upon where they are so that they can fulfill the, the afternoon activities. So perhaps you do a pre and post test. You, you measure what's a qualitative analysis of what's going on in the classroom, and then you engage in one, out, one minute of mindfulness for the next three months. And then you see what's the difference. So, but again, I want you to, to take away that, you know, how you measure it, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, is okay. Because it's how, how it's meaningful to you and how you're going to incorporate it into your practice. Yeah. So I'll just repeat, it's about documenting that you engage in mindfulness practice. The frequency, the occurrences, when, just like in the teacher example, the teacher can show that it was conducted Monday through Friday for three months in a row. And for you, again, it's how you, how you decide to measure that and then what your evidence would be. Okay. So Christina's gonna present another example. <coughs> oh, I lost my clicker. Can I borrow your clicker? Thank you. So this is just another example um, of how members have used their lived experience. Because um, as Jennifer mentioned, Aaliyah, Jennifer, and I speak to members every day about the CCP and their different life experiences that they're encountering and how this can be meaningful to their practice. So again, we have a, a member here who, after years of practice and helping people overcome their own challenges, has now become to develop anxiety and has had difficulty coping with life stressors and they've experienced less and less ability to cope and recognize that they need to access mental health programs themselves in order to assist with their daily life. So what would be some strengths that we would see from a member who's had this member in this situation? What would be some strengths that they could identify? Yeah. The ability to recognize they need help. The ability to recognize they need help, insight, right? I mean, that, that's a big strength and the ability to say that we need help, right? Um, I mean, we know as helpers ourselves, you know, it's often a lot easier being on our side of the, the chair than it is to be on the other and, and how much courage it takes for our clients to come in. Yeah? Knowledge of resources that they can access. Knowledge of resources that they can access. Absolutely. That's a big one. And so just saying that, you know, when this person here, that they were able to accept that they needed help. Um, and they also noticed that they have a strong support network. And some of the peer feedback that they got was that they need to have connect with their peer feedback network, pardon me, that they need to connect with their support network more and that they need to be more open about learning about their health needs and the resources available to them. Their learning needs and interests would be able to better engage in a better work-life balance and to learn coping strategies. And how this, the relevant standard to this one um, is again in competence and integrity that members don't engage in practice while they're suffering from illness, right? And so acknowledging that and acknowledging that you need to get some help and living that. Um, so some of their learning goals is to connect with a mental health professional and to engage in reflection, review, and um, determination of different resources that are available to them in the community. So again, just some of the activities that they may embark on in order to meet these needs. Um, engage in mindfulness practice. We're talking a lot about mindfulness today. Um, this is not an endorsement for mindfulness. <laughs> um, but it's not, a, not an endorsement. Um, to learn about EAP services and other resources available. 
So again, how would people feel that they might be able to make a learning goal based on where they're at? I'm suffering from my own mental health issues. I need to take a break from practice. I need to engage within some own professional health services myself. I'd like to ask a question sure. in relation to that. You're, I understand that if a social worker is not confident, then mm -hmm. they're not going to be practicing. But there's a huge continuum there is. between going to see a therapist because you need some extra help with caregiving for someone or some of your anxiety, which does not mean <laughs> Uh, allow me to repeat. So, and please correct me if I, I mis misquote you, um, but we're talking about the continuum of mental health issues, and there's a large difference between experiencing some anxiety and being incompetent and incapable to work. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying that anybody, we acknowledge that there's a, a large continuum. What we're trying to illustrate in this example is that if somebody needed to take a break from work for health reasons, that that can still be part of your CCP goals. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you also, so I get that, mm -hmm. but can you also, I had not seen this from your other, from the other CCP documents we had before. I thought this was relatively new about putting down your mental health issues, mm -hmm. or something like that. So that's okay, but mm -hmm. again, I would still say, it's easy to know when you have to, well, it, may not, it may not be easy to know, but you may know you're stopping practice for a while, but lots of people see a therapist ongoing yeah. from multiple issues that will always help them in their practice as well. Absolutely. So that's okay too. Absolutely. Because I'm not sure, I could be wrong, but I don't know how many people want to put down that they shouldn't be practicing because of mental health issues, because of the college, because of the college. Whether it's true or not, but because of the college. And we're not suggesting that people aren't. I think. I'm, I'm hoping that it's very clear in this illustration that we're trying to show how the CCP document is meaningful and flexible and a living document that is meant to be accessible to people based on the variety of their different life experiences. Can I have another, so, since I've got this. Yeah. So, so <laughs> the, because I came for some reasons. The, the goals, again, per year can be as many as we want. Is that mm -hmm. the idea? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the goals are only going to be, you're ticking off one of the standards of practice or two or three that relate to the goal. Whereas, as you were saying, before we had to put a strength and a weakness or whatever you call it per, per standard of practice, which drove me crazy. We didn't, actually. That was a big misinterpretation. And I had that before for many years as well, believing that we had to do one for each standard. But that was absolutely never a requirement. Well, gee, it should have been said, gee, this is years I've been doing this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm getting waves from time. So we actually had one more uh, scenario in case we needed it, but we don't because this is a very engaged audience. So all of this to say that Jennifer and I have talked a bunch about lived experience because it was obviously one of the several um, areas that were not understood about the CCP. And so we wanted to make sure that people were aware that this has always been something that's been part of the CCP and that this is something that we, again, want to make this a meaningful practice for all of us. But we have to exercise some professional judgment. Um, and that formal learning activities, we obviously still recommend that. Go to your courses, go to your conferences, you know, read your articles, read your books, do all of that. Um, and that we have to be mindful of the professional and personal boundaries in our lived experience. As Jennifer talked about in her example, that you know, figuring out that difference between being a social worker, being a patient, and, and how those boundaries can blur, and making sure that you're clear in that when you're doing your professional development. We also need to look at the appropriateness <laughs> of the lived experience and, and, uh, and how it contributes to our continuing competence. I gave the example last session, that, you know, I've decided to take tennis lessons recently. Um, that's not going to, I love it, it's great, and, but it's not going to enhance my practice as a social worker. So that wouldn't be something that would be appropriate to put on your CCP. So what we, yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, we had the same conversation last time. You're right, social workers can make doing tennis as part of your CCP. You're absolutely right. Stamina, ability to pivot, adapt. <laughs> Multitask. How, how we did adapt it was that if you had a goal to enhance your self-care, tennis could be a result. But your goal was self-care, not to learn how to play tennis, right? <laughs> exactly. And so what you want to have ask yourself is, does this lived experience support your readiness to practice or your ability to continue to practice? Right? So that's, yep. I was just going to ask you. 
I personally don't practice on family, friends, or colleagues. No. A social work, but no. in that capacity, you often have all three approach you for suggestions, mm -hmm. you know, the unloaded and stuff like that. And so, nevertheless, you end up, um, you know, giving some informal feedback. And um, so, I'm very clear on boundaries mm -hmm. because I don't want to get caught up in that little word. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, I mean, would that be, can you use that as a lived experience? Because it does come out, but it's also a great area. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it'd be a very interesting one that you could actually approach that one from a different, from a couple different perspectives. I mean, one could potentially be the resources that you were talking to them about that maybe you needed to go and do some research and, and provide them with resources. But it's also an exercise in learning how to navigate dual relationships, and that could also be on your CCP as well. Yeah. And boundaries, and boundaries in general, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So the question is how many hours for your CCP? We don't have guidelines on that. Um, typically speaking, what we found out through our evaluation was that our members report that they're doing an average of 25 hours of professional development a year. Um, oftentimes members do many more than that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly, right? But that's kind of the typical. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes? We'll start here and then there. Go ahead. You need the oh. microphone? She's coming. <laughs> I have two questions. I'm in private practice, mm -hmm. and social workers in private practice usually work in isolation. Mm -hmm. So it's the peer evaluation question that I'm asking. Um, in my practice, I do give clients an evaluation at the end, and that gives me <coughs> feedback. It's mm -hmm. not peer, it's client mm -hmm. feedback. Is mm -hmm. that okay? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to take us back to that, that slide where I believe it includes client. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I, I, that's a great practice, okay, great reflective you. practice. The second question is, for that learning experience, mm -hmm. sometimes with a client, there's issues that you really have to educate yourself. Yeah. As an example, I had a client with pornography. Mm -hmm. And I needed to educate myself. No, I didn't watch it. But I, sorry, I needed to educate myself on that in order to be able to provide service to the client. Mm -hmm. So would that be absolutely learning? Absolutely. If, if you're working with a client where you need to enhance your competence and, um, in order to provide service, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. There was another question. Oh, sorry, behind you. There was a gentleman. Yeah, I'm gonna pass. You're going to pass? Yeah. Okay. On your slide that says common CCP activities, yeah. the bottom one says committee work, professional networking, that. or teaching. Yep. So you are teaching someone and that's what that's? Yep. Okay, I, I do part-time work for a, a company that does workshops. I have to read, learn their workshops and teach them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're learning. Yeah. <laughs> right, you're enhancing your professional capacity. Yeah, it's not my material, I yeah. have to use their material. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure there's a lot of other learning activities that are involved yes. in that. Mm -hmm. well, just learn in their material. And mm -hmm. probably how they deliver it as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yes? Is it anything different? So the question was, is it anything different for someone who's practicing psychotherapy? Um, if you're a member of our college, it's no different. All members of our college have to complete the CCP. So I just wanted to leave you with a, a final thought. Sure. No problem. Uh, your registration with the college um, and your annual completion of the CCP, it demonstrates to the public that you're qualified and current in your practice and, and that you can, can you t continue to learn and develop as a professional. 
And so it's one of the ways in which we're going to enhance our own practice and we're going to be able to continually offer our clients our most update and competent service. And so that's why we feel that it's just so important for us to continually maintain our competence to make sure that we are providing the most thorough, best, up-to-date current practice for our clients. And I, uh, I know by all of you being in here that that's a, a goal that we all subscribe to. So thank you all very much. <laughs> the battery's dying it or must be. the Wi-Fi. Yes. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, that was very informative and helpful to give me shirt back. No problem, yeah. of course. Yeah. Seven years. Well, uh, probably 2009. It's part of our standards of practice that for all of the documents that you have, you have to keep them for seven years. And so we look at the CCP documents as similar to that. Hi. In this year. Just, just, so no, you can hang on to them for as long as you like, but you just have to.